and get into it. Okay, welcome everybody to this week's God is the Boss, where we do kingdom business. It is such a pleasure to be here with you powerhouse ladies. And today we're going to be talking about Zacchaeus. You guys remember a few weeks ago when we talked about Zacchaeus, the short despised tax collector in a tree. And so I'm going to share a story with you about Zacchaeus, and it's going to help you to create two stories, two testimonies that you absolutely need in order to fulfill the great commission that Jesus left right when he resurrected in between resurrection and ascension. He left a great, a great commission. He said to us, listen, go out and share my teachings with your wife. No, that's not what he said. Go out and share my teachings with your husband. That's, that's not what he said. Go out and share my teachings with your homegirls. That's not what he said. He said, go forth and share my teachings with all nations, all nations. And so as a part of sharing your teachings, what you will find out is there will be people who will say, well, what brought you to the Lord? And how has the Lord changed your life? And you need to be able to share those stories in less than two minutes. You can't be long-winded. You got to get straight to the point. And so I'm going to give you an easy format to practice in order to make this happen. So there are two testimonies I'm going to help you with today. And as I share in Luke 19, for those of you that have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke 19 and hold it there. As I share with you in Luke 19, I want you to pull out pointers about Zacchaeus that's going to help you to write your two testimonials that you absolutely must have. Because a lot of the times when we are victorious, when we are converted, a lot of the times we'll forget the valleys that we were once in. And I want to prime your memories. I want you to go back and revisit those moments so that you can reach back and you can help other people. And you may even be able to extract something through this process that will help you to come up with your brand story. Now, this is important, whether you're in ministry or you're in business. And believe it or not, if you're a believer, you are in both. We're all called to minister. You may, you may be the minister of wealth, the minister of finance, the ministers, minister of, of relationships, the minister of, um, let's see, health, wealth, relationships, yeah, and health. No matter what it is that you're called to do, my loves, that you need to know that the human race wants to secede all of us in three main categories, three main categories. We all wanna be successful at health, with, with our health, with wealth and with relationships. And so if you can narrow it down to at least one of those three, that either you're in the health sector, the wealth sector or the relationship sector, then we can really niche you down. And if you need help with niching, just go and look in one of these YouTube videos and you can grab one of them. And while I'm at it, let me just say, don't forget to subscribe and like to this video as well. Okay, so let me share my screen here. And this is gonna be so simple. I mean, one of my gifts, and I know my developmental opportunities. I don't believe in strengths and weaknesses. I believe in strengths and developmental opportunities. I know my strengths, but one of my gifts is that I can make complex things simple. And this is really simple. Okay, so I want you to look at this sheet and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna drag it into the chat box as well so that you can grab it and you can save it and you can do whatever it is you need to do to it. But you see here where it says First Peter, it says, listen, we all need to be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in us with meekness and fear, meaning be gentle. Don't force it on them. Be gentle. So let me give you the guidelines first. So when you are writing your testimony or your recovery story, I need you to keep in mind that you got to keep it at least two minutes or less. Don't be long winded with folks. They don't want it. And then also when you are sharing it, especially your conversion story, which is the first testimony, your conversion story, what brought you to faith? When you are sharing your conversion story, one of the things I need for you to be cognizant of is church language, cognizant of scripture language. Because if you're speaking to someone who is not a believer, they won't understand when you say, when God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son and who shall ever believe in him. They won't understand that. It's like you were putting French or Spanish or Hebrew 
into your testimony and they don't speak those languages. I need for you to remember that layman terms language that you spoke when you were a non-believer before you came into faith. Remember, this is your conversion story. And usually when you share your conversion story, usually you are sharing it with non-believers. Now in those rare instances when you are sharing it with believers, Feel free to plug in scripture. It is absolutely amazing when you do. But when you do it, don't exaggerate. Because I will tell you, when I was converted, I didn't see clouds and angels and things like that. And that's absolutely fine. Not everybody's got to see all of that. And it's great if you did. But my point is, if you saw it, say it. If you didn't, don't. But keep it real. I want you to keep it real and authentic all the way through when you're sharing your conversion story. Again, your conversion story is the testimony you're going to give about how you came to faith. Now, your recovery story is something like when they say, have have Sister Sanders come up here and share a testimony, right? And she comes up and she talks about something that happened. So, and how she recovered. Your recovery story, I want you to think of your recovery story as like a supplement. When we go to the vitamin store and we get a supplement, it's because we're deficient in something or because we want to expand on something. Like my iron might already be great, but I want more iron for some reason, right? So your recovery story is like a supplement for other believers because there are people out there who are going through something that you once conquered. And if you can share with them how you recovered and you can bridge it to Christ when you share it, that is so powerful because we have a lot of people who are suffering in silence when you agree. We got a lot of people who got the weight of the world on their shoulders, but because we live in a society where they're like, listen, you know, even when I I post stuff on social media, it's like I'm only posting my best life. I'm not sharing my my horrible, you know, uh, circumstances with you. I'm not sharing the challenges. I'm not, I'm going I'm to take the bad looking salad and toss it to the side of the camera. And I'm just going to show you the good looking vegetables that's on my plate. So your recovery story is meant to help other people. We got to start being more transparent with folks. We got to, especially for those of you that want to develop into stronger leaders. One of the best characteristics of strong leaders is that they are willing to be vulnerable. They are. They're like, I'm human. But one of the reasons why ministries and churches are are suffering is because there are a lot of people in the congregation who show up and they see this perfectness, just perfectness. And so they think, oh my goodness, when I have a problem, I need to disappear for a while, figure it out. And then when I get things together and I'm a better fit, then I can show up so I can be a part of this perfect environment. So please share those moments um, with them through your recovery story. Now, let's very quickly go through the your conversion story, because your conversion story is about all about how you convert it into faith. And your recovery story might be something like a supplement you're sharing with the congregation. Your recovery story is I went through these things and let me show you how the word helped me. I went through these things and let me show you what, let me share with you what God said to me. And little do you know it, somebody else out there who is suffering the same thing in silence, you are helping them. You are taking your mess and you are turning it into a message. For those of you that feel like, oh my goodness, I'm called to speak, but I don't have a message. It's because you haven't addressed your mess. You got to go back and write out that mess and figure out where God was in the mess. And then you turn it into a message. You turn your tests, all those tests you've been through into a testimony. So let me give you an example. Let's start with the conversion story. In two minutes or less, remember it's not dramatic, you're telling the truth. And you're gonna use layman's terms, language. What my life was like before Christ, for me, Queen Aza, My life before Christ, I was making six figures. I had several degrees. I had a few businesses. 
I was an atheist and I was a feminist. And for some reason, everywhere I went, people would try to convert me. They would try to proselytize me. And I thought, why would I become a Christian? I'm like, I'm doing this myself. And no self-respecting woman would ever become a Christian because Christianity relegates women. Why would I be submissive? I got it going on. And I'm just keeping it real. And then I will go to number two, how I met Christ as savior. Well, because all these people kept trying to proselytize me, convert me, I figured the struggle was real and I need to free other women. And so I was going to write this tell all book about how Christianity was destroying women and it was killing our strength and it was making us weak. But the problem with writing a book, if you want the book to be valuable, is that it requires tons of research. And so this research started off for me with contrast and comparison. So I wanted to compare different faiths to Christianity. So I went to a synagogue. And when I got to the synagogue during their worship service, when they stood, I stood. When they sat down, I sat down. But when they said Shalom, I didn't say Shalom. I just wrote down my notes. I just wanted to blend in. And then I went to a mosque. And when I got to the mosque, when they stood up and they bowed and got down on their knees, I did it. But when they said, you know, in Allah's name and things like that, I didn't I didn't pray to Allah. I just went home and I wrote up my notes for my book. Then eventually I went to a church and when they stood up and prayed, I stood up, but I didn't pray. And when they sat down, I sat down. I just wanted to blend in. But when they said in Jesus name, amen, I didn't say amen. I just wrote up my notes. But it was interesting because when I got to that church, a pastor came out and keep in mind, I was a feminist. A woman came out and she just started sharing these, oh my heart, just this powerful word. And it wasn't her, even though it, it was such an honor to see a woman, you know, to, to just stand in this leadership role, but it was the word that she shared. It convicted me. I was convicted by the word. And I found myself getting misty eyed. Like the spirit was moving me and I didn't understand it. But I fought back the tears because keep in mind, I was still an active duty soldier. And I went home and I tried to write up the notes, but I felt uneasy when I was writing up the notes. So I went back again the next week and the next week and the next week. And by the sixth week or so, when they stood up, I stood up. And when they said something great, I found myself saying, amen and hallelujah. And then eventually the tears would just roll. I'm a firm believer that Christianity is called, not taught. Raise your hand if any of you went to a four year university and you learned about Jesus Christ and read a Bible and then you, when you graduated, you was like, okay, now I'm going to be a believer. Raise your hand. Anybody? No, it's called not taught, right? Holy Spirit comes for you. And so how Christ changed my life? I have peace. I have indescribable peace. For the first time in my life, I actually like myself like i love myself but i like myself it's just amazing and it's amazing to see that i was this woman who was writing this blasph blasphemous book about christianity now i'm in seminary school graduating with a degree in pastoral counseling so it's as simple as that i didn't use scripture i didn't over exaggerate i just kept it real and when you share a story like that with your journey and people want to know, well, why didn't you choose Islam? Or why didn't you choose, you know, to be a Buddhist or Catholicism or whatever? You're able to kind of answer those questions in your testimony. So keep that in mind for your conversion story. <clears throat> and with your recovery story, it's very simple. You're just going to answer this very similar questions. My life seemed normal until, well, for me, my life seemed normal until I got a call about 9.06 a.m. in the morning telling me that my best friend who was in my everyday had died and he had been dead for the past 18 hours. So last night while I was brushing my teeth and getting ready for bed and watching TV, I had no idea, but Artez was in the hospital dead, COVID. And so I started binge eating, eating hot Cheetos and, and hot cake cakes and all this other stuff and gaining weight and breaking out because I really felt the wealth weight of his death that night. And then number two, I discovered hope and helping Jesus when I opened up scripture and I went to Psalms 23, but I read it differently this time. I read it in a way that I had never seen it. When I read Psalms 23, I got to this one piece where it says, 
He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. I had read that so many times. For some reason, it hit differently for me. For the first time, I picture Artez really at peace because he was a believer. Oh, he was devout. Oh, he was devout. And it brought me such comfort. And I began to understand death and grief better. And I can transition to number three and say, I'm glad that I have a personal relationship with Jesus today because over the past four months, I've gotten four phone calls saying that two people that I love only have four hours to live. They didn't die the first two times I got the call, but they only had a few hours to live. And once again, I had the weight of the world on my shoulders, but I was so glad I now had this personal relationship with God because I had already been, I'd been spiritually inoculated. So it didn't hit me like it hit me before. And then later on on social media, while just scrolling, I discovered on Facebook that two other people that I love dearly had died and had been dead for weeks. And I'm watching their funeral on Facebook and nobody even told me. People I went to high school with, right? And so, so happy that I have this personal relationship with God. Now I can go into details about it, but for the sake of the time that we have here, I'm gonna keep it short. I want you to understand that if I were to stand up and share my recovery story about death and grief, that would help so many people in the congregation, especially during a time where people are still dropping like flies due to COVID and other preventable illnesses. And then for this last one, number four, where it says, may I share something, share how something like this can happen to you? That's optional. You really have to exercise the spirit of discernment before you go into number four. Chances are you won't use number four. Let the Holy Spirit do his thing. Because if you come to me, came to me years ago, when I was queen 1.0, before I became coach queen 3.0, and you went into this, may I share something, share how something like this can happen to you, I would dismiss it. You got to trust that the Holy Spirit will do his work. But if the spirit says, yeah, share that, share number four with her or him, then you might say, come to, um, come to our women of worth meeting. You may sh- sh- introduce them to the men of valor meeting. You may invite them to a women's breakfast. You may invite them to Bible study, but you need to have a resource on how this can happen to them, how you can help guide them. All right, any questions before I get into the scripture? Any questions? All right, well, let's keep it going. I don't see any questions. All right. All right, so turn with me now to Luke 19. I'm going to be using Bible Gateway. You guys know I love the free app Bible Gateway. They do a lot of advertising on here, but um, it is absolutely fine. So let me go here to Bible Gateway. And here in Bible Gateway, we are going to, no, no. We are going to start off with Luke 19. I'm going to use the, you know what? I think I'm going to use the ESV. I like the ESV. It's, it's, It's easier to digest. And actually, like I always tell you, powerhouses, when you are studying scripture, please don't just read one version. Go in, go use the NIV, and then go and read the ESV, and then read the New King James Version as well. You just get so much from it when you do that, when you stack it that way. So we're just going to concentrate on one through six, and we're talking about Jesus and Zacchaeus. And just to bring you some context here, Jesus is about to approach Jericho. And usually when I open up a book, like right now we're in Luke, one of the primary questions I ask is, what is the purpose of the book of Luke? Like how, what, when can I rely on Luke? Well, Luke is the book that you can rely on when you are trying to figure out ethical situations, ethical meaning good and bad behavior. Luke is the book that teaches us how to be better stewards of our money because Jesus does a lot of interactions with the wealthy and the rich. Luke is the book you turn to, especially for those of you that have businesses that help people who are overlooked, right? And so Luke is the book that you go to when you want to see how God, how Jesus is interacting with the disabled, with the poor, with with women, overlooked people, especially during this culture and time. And so that is why we go to Luke 
well, one of the reasons. So now we're in uh, the book of 19, we're in the book of 19, we're in the book of Luke chapter 19. And before Jesus has gotten here, he's done some pretty amazing things. I mean, parents have brought their kids to him and said, hey, listen, will you please just touch them and bless off on our kids? And there's even one instance where the disciples rebuke their parents, like leave them alone. Like we're trying to do some, we're trying to get through here. And Jesus stop the disciples and said, listen, you stop it. Unless you become like a child, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Another thing that happened is Jesus has healed the blind beggar, which is amazing. So some pretty miraculous things has happened. And now Jesus is about to interact with Zacchaeus and we're about to get this panoramic view of the interaction of the story. So let's get into it. <clears throat> he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Other versions say short, short in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he, meaning Jesus, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they, they saw it, they all grumbled, they complained. He has gone to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. Some versions say notorious sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Okay, so you're probably wondering, Queen, how does this relate to my conversion story and my recovery story and my business and blah, 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 blah. All right, I got you. And I'm going to show you um, how I study scripture. And I'm hoping that as we go through it, if you've already printed out the, the sheet, the recovery and conversion testimony, that's great. If you have not, just kind of get some pen and paper and I want you to take bulleted notes because I'm hoping that this is gonna prime your memory, jog your memory of some great things that you can put in your conversion story and also in your recovery story. Okay, let's get into it. So then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. One thing I wanna say here is Jericho is a very real place. You all know that. So instead of consistently going to the Bahamas and to Jamaica every year, you can save a few thousand dollars and you can go and walk the same path as Jesus. It is so enlightening. I know that a lot of you have, I believe Ruk Rukama, you have as well. I've been to Lot's wife, where Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt, to Jacob's well, where Jesus actually drunk water. Um, you can go visit the Dome of the Rock, which is significant to Muslims, but it's just so spectacular to see. I mean, you can actually visit these places. Okay, so That's side note. Thing. Yeah, you have. Yes, yes, I know you have. I mean, so many wonderful places. All right. So verse two. Now, behold, there was a name, a man named Zacchaeus. Everybody say Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Now, some pronunciations is Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector. Now, chief tax collector. This is important. Because raise your hand if you love the IRS. Who loves the IRS? Let me see. Anybody? Anybody seen the IRS, a Christmas card? Zacchaeus is the IRS. And nobody likes nobody who messed with our money. So he was hated. He was despised because he was a chief tax collector and also because he was oppressing his own people. He was a Jew working for the Romans as a tax collector. He was oppressed and he was taking advantage of his position. So he was despised. I want you to keep that in mind because as you pivot or you grow your business, I need for you to ask yourself, is the business, is the sector I'm in, is it exploiting my people? Is it? 
Am I serving them three stacks of hamburger meat and a whole basket of fries and they're going to die 10 years early because I want to make a buck? Are you exploiting your own people and what it is that you're doing? Are you exploiting yourself? Do you know that God is calling you to do something else, but you're doing something completely opposite because somebody dangled that golden carrot in front of you and now you're off chasing money? Are you oppressing yourself? Which means that you're oppressing your family. Are you? All right, so let's keep going. All right, so he was a tax collector and he was rich. He was rich. Let me tell you how tax collectors became rich. They took from their people so that they can pay their superiors. And they also took some extra money so that they can live the laugh of luxury as well. So he was exploiting his people. He was rich. But I love verse three. It says, and he sought to see who Jesus was. And I'm stopped there. He sought to see who Jesus was. This is important because now in your recovery story or your conversion story, I need for you to remember who you were before you found faith and how that affected your, the social economics of your life. And it'll start to open up the doors for you to see why you sought or needed Jesus. You can go online, even if you're writing your conversion story or your recovery story uh, to be impactful to the people that you're called to help. You can go online and you can look up all the reasons why people seek. Why do they seek? You have Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs that says that people need safety and food and all these other things. And these are the things that people seek. And if they don't feel safe, they're not thinking about food. If they don't have food, they're not thinking about vacations. So there are different reasons why people seek. You have other articles like psychology today you have the hell the uh, world health organization that is saying that people are seeking because we need purpose people feel like they don't have meaning in their lives so they seek i need for you to go in and look at your target audience and say why are they seeking they may not say it out loud but they're seeking so zacchaeus he was seeking which is really interesting because he was rich. Ecclesiastes says that money answers all things. That's in scripture, money answers all things. Zacchaeus has money, so clearly he has a problem that is not a thing. There are some things that money just came by. And I can almost guarantee you that everybody on this call has something in their history, something on their shoulders that they will absolutely empty their bank account to solve. I would empty my bank account to bring Artez back. I absolutely would, my best friend who died in my recovery store. I would empty it in a second, everybody. So he sought, he sought to see who Jesus was and we don't know why he was seeking, but I suspect he was spiritually unfulfilled. You got folks out there that are swimming in money. I mean, they are swimming in money. How many of you remember my definition of rock top? Anybody remember rock top? Rock top? Okay, so rock bottom, we know what rock bottom is. Rock bottom is nobody don't love me. I don't have no money. I don't know how I'm gonna pay these bills. I'm down in the valley and I'm depressed. I have just hit rock bottom. We've heard that expression, right? Rock top is the absolute opposite. Rock top is I got money, I got cars. There are people who wanna be around me. I can get companionship, but for some reason there's a void inside of me. I'm just not happy. I'm spiritually unfulfilled. Those are all those wealthy people that we hear about that are suiciding and et cetera and et cetera. It's like, you got it going on. Why would you even try to do that? It looks like you got everything going for you. They have reached rock top. In my mind, when I read this, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, Zacchaeus has reached rock top. So he's seeking to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd. In other words, there was something in his way. I want you to think about what was in your way when you were seeking faith. What is your version of the crowd? When you were seeking Jesus, what was in your way for me? Cause you guys heard my conversion story earlier. For me, I was in my own way. Meism. 
I was basically my own God. I hate to say that. But before I found Jesus, I was my own God. That means I was responsible for my own standard of morality of what was good and what was bad. That means that I was my own judge. I was responsible for it all, for solving my own problems. That means that if I had a financial problem, my, my finances could only rise to the level of the math that I knew. That's sad. I was my own God. I was in my own way. I was the crowd. But you, <clears throat> you might say you can't see who you couldn't see who Jesus was. Or even if we converted to business, I couldn't <clears throat> see my way to launch my business because of technology. Technology might be your crowd. Your crowd might be distractions. Loves, when you roll over in the morning, please do not get on social media. Research shows that even if you go on social media to just get a phone number or an address, we get sucked into a vortex. We get sucked into a crowd. And when you believe that you're just going on social media for two minutes, two hours has elapsed. elapsed. It is a distraction. And research shows that productivity decreases by 40%. When you get on social media first thing in the morning, so you roll over, you open your phone, you go to Facebook, that's 40% cut off right there. That is the crowd. I want you to think about who the crowd is for your recovery and for your conversion testimony. Now it says he sought to see Jesus, who, who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd for he was of short stature. I love this for he was of short stature. Stature. When I read this, <clears throat> although I'm not physically short, I am five foot six, 66 inches tall. I took it a different way. I started thinking about all the times that I came up short. When you read this, and hopefully you will go back and read this and to decipher it for yourself, I want you to think about all the times that you came up short. You were trying to see Jesus. But the crowd was in the way. The crowd was technology. The crowd was, you think that you don't speak well enough. I tell you all the time, I'm not a gifted speaker, but I am a courageous one and I get paid to speak. You don't have to be gifted because calling will always trump training. Calling will always trump training. So he was short in stature. I want you to think about the times that you came up short. I was thinking about when I was raising my first two kids, I say first two because they're out of the house and I have two that are in the house now. And I was thinking about how we would go to church and we would go to church once a week, but that was a huge gap in between what church life looked like and my home life looked like. So we would be listening to B Smalls on the way to church and on the way home from church, we're listening to Tupac, right? For example, I was coming up short. I want you to think about the times that you came up short, meaning you just didn't get there. You just didn't cut it like you tried, but you just didn't make it. You came up short. So this is what Zacchaeus did. He ran, he climbed. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Let me get this straight. He's rich. Rich people don't run. Rich people don't make a fool out of themselves, but he ran like a child. And he climbed like a child. That is so beautiful to me because here it is with this man who's saying, listen, I'm desperate. I got money, but money ain't solving my problems. I'm desperate. So I am going to run and I am gonna climb a tree just to get a view. I don't even know if he's gonna be here. I just heard he's passing through. I'm gonna run and I'm gonna climb. And this is so significant because Jesus just said, Unless you become like a child, you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so what does Zacchaeus do? He runs like a child. He climbs like a child. He's swallowing his pride. Sometimes when I'm going through stuff and I'm feeling prideful, I just, like I'm climbing a tree, like a child. God, I'm like a child again. I want you to remember that when you're going through stuff and you feel like, okay, I need to do this, but I'm afraid of how it's going to make me look just, you might look crazy, but it's okay. You're embracing your inner child again. 
Zacchaeus wasn't afraid to become like a child, which is really important because from what I've heard, from what I've read in psychology, there are a lot of short people that have Napoleon syndrome and they don't like to do things that make them look shorter. So now here I am picturing Zacchaeus in this tree with his legs dangling from a branch because he just ran and he climbed into a sycamore tree just to see him. When you're writing your recovery testimony and your conversion testimony, I want you to be vulnerable and talk about your version of running and climbing and talk about the things that you did. It, it hurts me to say that I thought of myself as my own God. It, it, it does that I really have to swallow a pride pill to say that out loud. It, it hurts me to say that I was writing a book against God. And that's how I found God. I have so much in common with Saul, known as Saul, Saul before he became Paul. But I share that because I know that it is going to help somebody. So in addition, I want you to think about the fact that Zacchaeus is out there. He's in need of Jesus. He has this void. But see, God already knew what he needed. God already knew that he was going to give him the opportunity to make the choice long before Zacchaeus was even born. How do I know that? Because Zacchaeus climbed into a sycamore tree. Trees don't grow overnight. God planted that tree long before Zacchaeus' parents ever met. Long before Zacchaeus was even born, God was like, yep, I already know this is going to happen. I'm going to give Zacchaeus a choice. He can swallow his pride and climb this tree, or he can say, well, the crowd is in the way and he can just go back home. Whatever it is that you are going through, my loves, I want you to know that God has already planted options all around you, all around you. The question is, are you willing to become like a child and climb the tree? Are you willing to embrace your inner child and do it? A lot of people come to me and they say, well, Queen, listen, I, I want to speak. I want to launch my own business, but I'm afraid to fail. And, and they want me to do confidence exercises with them. And I can do that all day long. But here's what I want you to remember. Confidence is a cowardice game. Even for those of you that are teaching confidence, confidence is a cowardice game. It's like saying, I'll only do this if you can guarantee me I will not make a fool of myself. So what if you make a fool of yourself? So what? You can go on stage and do absolutely beautifully. They still gonna talk about you. We already talked about the crowd. Say they, 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 say they, they, they are, as you grow, so does your foe. And that's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine. So do not be afraid to fail because I'm telling you loves that some of your greatest, your biggest lessons come from failure. Most of the people who I admire and study, these people, oh my goodness, these businessmen and women, they got a graveyard of businesses behind them. They tried so many things and they failed. And they tried and they failed. And they learn so many different things. If I tell you all the businesses I tried and I failed at, <laughs> it's, it's just crazy. But I could build a business almost overnight because of that. And when people are calling me worried because they got workers that steal and workers that break stuff and, and because they got hit with a new ordinance, I just sit there and I'm like, I've been battle tested. We can fix this in five minutes because I fail, but it was a worthy fail. So whenever you're going through something and you're being tested and you feel like, oh my goodness, I didn't succeed at that. No, that was a worthy fail. It absolutely was. It is your version of a curriculum for the university that is perfectly designed for you. Okay, let's keep going. Cause I wanna get you guys into your breakout room so you can talk to each other and share. So I talked about the tree. I want you to look around and find your tree. Your tree is not rocket science. Your tree might be, I wanna start a plant-based restaurant. I may not have the funds to get a brick and mortar business right now and to start at full scale, but I know I can meal prep at home. 
Your calling might be to start a fashion line like Kis Kia to start a fashion line for faith based women who want to look good while they're looking modest. And you might say, well, I don't have all the money for fabric and I don't have money for a brick and mortar. But guess what? I can find three people who may want a personal stylist right now and I can start from home. I can crawl, I can walk, then I can run, and then I can soar. But it takes in the beginning swallowing your, swallowing your pride and saying, ah, it's okay if I don't start off at that biggest picture right there. I tell you one of the sayings that I teach is that if you are proud of your first hundred videos that you shoot when you're speaking, then you start it too late. You start it too late. It don't matter if you fumble through it, loves. You have to grow up before you blow up in this industry. And that means that you got to be able to embrace the worthy fails. Lots of them sometimes. And that's ab absolutely fine because you've been battle tested. Battle tested. You are resilient. You are fearfully right. and wonderfully made. When I sit and think about when I was pregnant and I had twins in my stomach and they both died in my stomach and I've been carrying, carrying my twins around for months and they haven't kicked or moved and I have to push them out. They're inducing my labor and now I'm giving birth and I'm holding my twins. I've been battle tested. I'm resilient. You think I'm worried about a failed business? I've held dead babies. Battle tested. You have been battle tested too. You can't be worried about somebody. Oh, what are they gonna say if I go on social media live so I can put some visibility on my business? You worried about that? You probably lost a home, probably was homeless. And I hate to say it, and I was a sexual assault response coordinator. So sensitivity, you know, I'm sending just positive energy if you have been through this, but some of us have been molested and raped. I've been violated in the most inhumane ways. You think I care if you talk about my nails? You think I'm a let, I've been battle tested. You've been battle tested. Get out there and put in some work. Climb that tree, climb that tree. Get up that tree like Zacchaeus. Realize where you came in short like Zacchaeus. Get in that tree and let those legs dangle. Let it dangle, love. Okay, let me keep going. All right, so he's in the tree. And again, for all he knows is that Jesus is just gonna pass that way. He don't even know if Jesus is gonna stay, do it. He just gonna, just for a glimpse at Jesus. Reminds me of the woman with the issue of blood. If I could just only touch his garment. Oh, I just absolutely love that type of faith. And then this is, this is where I got shivers in this verse. It says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, oh my goodness. He said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. I'm gonna stop there. First of all, I can imagine myself in a tree with my legs dangling and Jesus looks up and says my name out of everyone in the crowd he says my name not the woman who didn't like my nails or the woman who didn't like my lipstick or the woman who didn't like the way i speak or he said my name not the woman who's perfect not the woman who does devotion every day in the morning he called my name just Ooh, reminds me of one of my favorite movies is The Lion King. And The Lion King, the hyenas say, just hearing his name, Mufasa, gives me shivers. And he's like, hey, say it again, Mufasa, 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 Mufasa. Like just hearing, just Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, oh my goodness. Can you just imagine Jesus looking up and saying, Sandra, Joy, Rukama, Stevie. Oh my goodness, just shivers. And I want you to remember this. In fact, check me, trust but verify. Now that's heaven on, that's heaven on earth. Oh. <laughs> that experience is right, tangible. Joy? tangible. Yes. yes, thank you, Joy, <laughs> right. My loves, I want you to remember this. My pastor always says, trust but verify. Trust but verify. You can go in and fact check me. 
anytime God calls someone by name, it is preceded by transformation. That means that something miraculous, something wonderful is about to happen. There are people out there that want God to call them by name. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that means your life ought to be turned upside down, <laughs> upside down. Think about Moses. Moses was out and he was, he was, uh, he was uh, guiding the flock for his father-in-law. And then God's voice projected from the burning bush and said, Moses, Moses. And then next thing you know, this man who said, I'm not an eloquent speaker, this man who escaped death as a child, this man who just killed someone and is hiding out in exile, next thing you know, because God called his name, now he's freeing the Israelites and he ends up writing the first five books of the Bible, Moses. We can even go to Adam. Adam, Adam, where are you? Now, because he was disobedient, now he's kicked out of the garden, him and Eve. And I'm not saying it's always positive when God calls your name, but I'm saying that whenever God calls your name, it precedes transformation. All right, so let's keep going. Okay. <clears throat> So Jesus calls to him, said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must stay at your house. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. In my westernized modern brain, living here in the United States, I'm from Atlanta, but I'm living in El Paso, Texas now. I'm like, you're not gonna give me no warning, no heads up today. Look at this today, not next week, today. You're staying at my house today. Hey, how many of you are ready? Your house is ready to receive God right now. Like if Jesus says, hey, listen, I'm coming to your house right now. You don't have to hide no boyfriend. You're not living with your boyfriend. Your house is in order. Your son not in the next bedroom smoking weed. That, that ain't popping off in your house. Your house is in order. In my mind, and I'm not saying you have to be perfect. That's not what I'm saying. Because I will tell you, I lived with a boyfriend once and my son used to smoke weed in my house. It don't happen today. I've been there. So my question to you is, are you ready? Are you gonna be like, God, give me, give me two hours head start? Or are you gonna be like, wait a minute, Jesus, we, we walking in together, like together, together. Like we gonna cross the threshold together. Give, give me like 30 minutes to wash the dishes, to make my bed. And I'm not even saying, is there a requirement for all that? Because Jesus already knows who we are. But is your house in order? today now i've already shared with you guys that you know I've, I've been to um israel and a few other areas um in in demona <clears throat> and what what i absolutely love about being there in the middle eastern eastern countries and, and not just not just back then a lot of them still do it today they consider it an honor for you to stay in their house especially family and friends it's not like how we are in the western society Western culture, we need one week notice. We got to fit you into our schedule. And then you're not going to stay longer than three days. You got to go because you're going to get on my nerves. Over there, it is a honor to serve you, to offer you almond milk. I already shared my almond milk story with you. To offer almond milk. They don't look at it like we do. And so today, and what I love about this scripture as well, well, I'll, I'll get to it because I think it's in the next one. Yeah, what I love about this is, so this is what happens. So Zacchaeus made haste and came down and received him joyfully. I really wish that when I first received the, or, the, the offer to become a daughter of the most high heavenly father, that I received him joyfully. Zacchaeus got it right away. You can knock him all you want for being a chief tax collector, for oppressing his people. But he was like, listen, I got this void and I got it. I'm making haste and I'm receiving him joyfully, joyfully. And I'm pretty sure that it was a nice spin because keep in mind, this man was despised. He was hated. And here it is, somebody who's saying, hey, I'm gonna stay at your house. But let's go into verse seven. But when they, ooh, they, they, 
when they saw it, they, when they saw it, they all complained. They didn't like it. They complained saying, how she gonna launch her business? She in a new thing every other year. Last year was multi-level marketing. The year after she was talking about writing a book. Now look at her, she wanna speak. Now look at her, she wanna be a life coach. Now look at her, she wanna launch a business. They, they all complain. But when they saw it, they all complained saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. I love that they use the word guest because this is Jesus going in the house. They didn't say he's going to, to pass judgment. He's going to interrogate. He's going to tell him what he needs to do. Say so he's going to be a guest. I want you to keep that in mind when you are sharing your testimony, your conversion testimony and your recovery testimony, because you don't want it to be pushy. I want you to think about yourself as being a guest in your audience's heart, as being a guest in their story, a guest that's just there to share. But <clears throat> something beautiful happens in between verse seven and verse eight. I love that, see all this space right here? It's a lot of space. For me, I'm reading to the space, right? It says in verse seven, Jesus went in as a guest. And let me say this too. What I loved about this is Jesus decided to go stay with Zacchaeus. Jesus loves outcasts. He, he has a heart for, he loves everybody, but he has a heart for outcasts. And scripture says that God doesn't want to leave anybody behind. Now, I, I want to quote it verbatim. Let's see if I have it here. Uh, because I want to give you the verse here. Let's see if I can find it. Where it says, uh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Where's the scripture? Mm, I think it's Matthew. I want to say Matthew 18. I, I can't read my handwriting, but it talks about how Jesus goes away, how he leaves the 99 sheep in order to go and save the one. And that just came to mind there as well. But one of the things I will share with you is that they complain. But what I love so much about Jesus is that he don't care about public opinion. We do, but he don't care about public opinion. In Philippians, it talks about how um, God, when he came to earth, he created no reputation for himself. I, I just believe for some reason with all my heart that if I am a God and I come to earth, I wanna start off at, at least in a supervisory position and start me off as a queen, an empress. Like I don't wanna start off as a carpenter. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like I, I, I'm thinking that, but Jesus didn't do that. Son of man, he's like, no. I'm gonna lead by example. I'm gonna show y'all how it's done. In scripture, it says that his thoughts are not our thoughts and our ways are not his ways. And thank God, thank God. Okay, so let, let me get back into the, the scripture because I wanna wrap this up. Okay, so they complain, he's gonna be a guest with a sinner. And something miraculous happens in between verse and verse seven because Jesus walks in as a guest and then bam, we jump into eight. It's like there's a portal somewhere right here. We jump right into eight and Zacchaeus stands and he's saying, Lord, look, I give half my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone that I have defrauded or by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. Right here. Zacchaeus has received salvation. Now we're going to read about it in verse nine, but we know that it has happened because one, he says, Lord, he calls Jesus Lord. So part of salvation, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior. He says, Lord, the other thing that we know is that there's a behavior change here. And I want you to keep this in mind when you're writing your, your testimonies, because in order for your audience to really understand that you have achieved salvation, we need to see a behavior change. There is a behavior change. Zacchaeus is willing to detach from his wealth. Are you willing to detach from the man that you may be living with that you're not married to? Are you willing to detach 
from your son who's smoking weed in the other room, even though you love him, even though he's your firstborn, even though he's adorable and he makes you laugh all the time. Are you willing to detach? Are you willing to detach from that job that's paying you six figures a year, but you know you're making cigarettes and you're spreading cancer? Are you willing to detach? There's a behavior change. Those are signs of salvation. So Zacchaeus, he stood and he said, listen, I'm, I'm changing. And then in verse nine, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he is also the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save which was lost. I love this because in the beginning, it says that Zacchaeus sought, he sought. And then in the very last verse, it says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Mm. And, and I can only think about what they thought when Jesus said he is also a son of Abraham. Let's see if I can get to the, the scripture real quick. Then I can get you into your breakout rooms. But I want you to keep in mind that this is what scripture says okay here we go i'll be reading luke 3 8. it says that therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves we have abraham as our father again do not begin to say to yourselves we have abraham as our father for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. So what are you saying, queen? What are you saying to me? I am saying that they, I'm sure they were upset that here it is, this man who has betrayed them and took advantage of them. Then you got Jesus calling him the son of Abraham. But what Jesus is saying is, listen, it doesn't matter if you are a direct bloodline descendant of Abraham because heritage does not guarantee you salvation. It doesn't guarantee you salvation. But here it is, this man who accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who exhibited a behavior change, who received salvation. He is also a son of Abraham. I absolutely love that. And the last thing I'm going to say is that I love this blank space in between verse seven and verse eight. I absolutely love that because what it says to me is, listen, I want you to ignore all these folks out there that have put all these conditions on you in order to accept Christ as your savior. You don't have to walk on hot mud and jump three times and travel all over the world. It's as simple as one house visit. Are you willing to repent? Are you willing to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you have faith? Are you willing to accept the call of the Great Commission, which is what you're going to do, especially as you embrace your conversion testimony and your recovery testimony? It's as simple as that because God does do on the job training. He tutors. You don't have to know it all in one day. He got your back. It's just as simple as that. Zacchaeus. Okay. Any questions? Any thoughts? Any questions? Any thoughts? Anyone? Who would mind unmuting and sharing the one rule that we have? What is the one rule we have? You have to give up the opportunity. Never pass up the opportunity to take, take the mind. mind. Yes. Never pass up the opportunity to take the mic. My loves, we're just speaking to share. We're not speaking to impress. It's okay if your thoughts are raw. You made me super emotional. Um, this whole verse, I just kept finding myself tearing up. And I went and printed out the page and I have notes everywhere on it um, of the scripture. And it, it was definitely a powerful ch share um, on get out the, get out the shadows and get in the light. And then when it said he was a sinner, I just marked down what you said. He just missed the mark. That's right. Oh. Just missed the mark. So, yes. Where in my life have I missed the mark? And or somebody else that I'm working with, have they just missed the mark? And it's not all the other heavy stuff that you carry to it. 
Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Rukama. You know, I got a few things out of that. One of the reasons why I dismantle all my other businesses and I made it very clear that if I can't talk about, if Jesus ain't in it, I'm not with it. I, I can't because it's going to come out of me because you got people out there that are saying I'm searching for purpose and I'm searching for meaning. And I'm like, how can I really help them if I don't introduce them to the word? I'm not really leading them. I'm not really putting them on the path. I'm just taking their money and they're going to bolo. They're going to bolo is military terminology. They're going to flop out. Now, there are some people who are successful and they don't have faith. We, we, we have to acknowledge that. But in my heart of hearts, I want to see the bigger picture and I want them to be heavenly successful. And so when someone comes to me and they say that they're seeking purpose or meaning and they are, are seeking, they, they want their families back and they're making money, but um, they have nobody to spend the money on because nobody wants to be around them and they got children and the children won't talk to them. And I'm like, listen, we need to talk about something that's bigger than what it is that you think you got going on. <clears throat> In Matthew, it says, seek first. What? What are we supposed to seek first? The kingdom and all else will follow. That's right. The, here's the formula. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's the first piece. The second piece is and righteousness and everything else will be given to you. But when we get it backwards, we get spanked. Zacchaeus, he sought first the things and then he sought the kingdom. He sought Jesus and then righteousness. So for a lot of us who are going through it, we just need to rearrange our formula because some of us already kind of got it going on. It's like, okay, I, I know I did it backwards, but now I got to go back and do it right because I got to seek first the kingdom and righteousness. And then all the other stuff, it'll come. I love that God don't do math like we do. He's like two loaves of bread, five fish. What? You get, I could feed 5,000? What? Is that right? Five loaves and two fish. I can repeat 5,000. He don't do math like we do math. You mean to tell me if I want a new house and I'm not saying to do it for material things, but I'm just saying if I want a new house and I want a car and I want to travel with my kids, I don't go and try to, you mean just seek the kingdom first and seek righteousness and then that just comes along with it? Yeah. Huh. Isn't that amazing? How his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways again. Okay. Oh, I just had a quick comment. I just had a quick comment. What I think about the one word that comes to my mind is release. You know, because it says humility before honor. But if you don't, first of all, you have to release. If yeah. you don't release the, you know, say nature affords a vacuum, nothing else can mm -hmm. come in. So before you can even get to all of that, everything that you said, you yeah. first have to go within and say, you know what, I need to just just relief let go let go and let the creator absolutely and i'm so glad you shared that because and i'm gonna get to stevie because when i read matthew and it says seek first the kingdom and righteousness i call that my relaxation verse i just yeah. i can just relax i just seek the kingdom right everything else comes just I, you give me permission to relax okay <laughs> absolutely i love it thank you so much for sharing that joy all right, Stevie, go ahead, beautiful. What you got? I was just going to add, oh, I've followed you for a long time and got to sit at your feet. You've always driven fast, but now you have a fast car is what it feels like. There's extra gears up in here because you were just, to and then it was just like, and then it was like, head back because she going, you just shifted gears. So I don't know, the new vehicle the vehicle is always there, but you are sitting in the in the bucket seat with all the gears and you know, and it's beautiful to watch and you blessed us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, I was going fast, but now I got a fast car. <laughs> Listen, don't be shocked if you see me on social media later talking about, are you going fast, but you need a fast car? I love that. We need to market that everywhere. Thank you so much, Stevie. Anybody else got a share? Hello. Anything? Yes, go ahead, Naima. I, yes, Naima. Um, this is my first time joining. Um, it, it was just really nice listening to your testimony, and then you talked about you know like leaving 
a job because I just, I just, this is my second week out of my job. I, I got a job. Uh, I work in the restaurant industry. Yeah. Um, for a very long time, I was a beverage manager, so I worked a lot with liquor and bars. And um, the, my recent job was in like Times Square. It was a very big deal. Um, family was very proud of me. I was making a, a good amount of money and. Um, it was kind of like the height of my career, something that I have worked towards. And before I even got the job, I asked God about it. And he told me no. And I was like, mm, I'll be OK. <laughs> you know, you want to just kind of do your own way and just think, like, how could you tell me no when this is a good opportunity? Um, and then um, probably around Easter, I worked there from November and probably around Easter, I knew God was calling me out and mm -hmm. It was, it took a lot to like, uh, walk away from it was, I was in conflict a lot. Um, but I got confirmation out of confirmation and it just, you know, when you, when you talk about, you know, are you exploiting people and God, had, and even then now, like, I still think like, did I make the right decision? But, um, God showed me in his word, he was like, it was in a Luke, and he was talking about how you scatter my people and, you know, if, if you're not gathering with me, you're scattering. And I realized that I have been scattering. And he showed me like, you you have no idea what it's gonna be like when you gather with me. Mm -hmm. So it's just a real uh, blessing to, you know, I wasn't even like, I found this on like Eventbrite, just randomly searching. Um, And so it's, it was just a good word that you said. And, you know, I'm in a place where I'm I'm figuring out what to do. I do have a business that I am growing and um but it just feels good to like not be scattering anymore oh thank you I don't know about you guys but Naima that fed me are you scattering or are you gathering thank you so much for not passing up the opportunity to take the mic and sharing that with me personally so thank you so much I receive that in so many ways you have no idea thank you <clears throat> Listen, loves, I want to get you into your breakthrough rooms. Don't go anywhere, um, but grab your social media handles. Grab your scheduling links because you may very well meet someone in the room who you want to connect with later and just really talk to someone at length. Um, before we get in there, if this is your first time, put a one in the chat. Usually I do that in the beginning, but I just jumped right into the call so quickly today. <laughs> like Stevie said, going fast versus having a fast car. Naima, one. Any other first timers here? Any other first timers? Okay, we have one. Usually we have like five or six. Okay, wonderful. Now, if this is your second time with us, put a two in the chat. And you guys know how it goes. If you're always here, put family. Because you're like, I'm always here, queen. Yes, Sandra family. I'm shocked you didn't remind me of it earlier, um, Sandra. Kiana family. Kiana, I remember when you was putting ones in the chat. <laughs> now you family. It's beautiful. Aunt D, yes, and Aunt D, um, please, if, if Aunt D st st sticks around, make sure you link up with her in the chat space. She's going to come in and do a beautiful presentation at the end of the month. Um, Jacora family, yes, Joy family, CV Fab family, yes, <laughs> Rukama family, yes, Terilyn, Sandra, yeah, all of you guys are family. Just thank you so much for just giving me something to do, purpose on a Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. Mountain time, my time here in El Paso. So listen, I, mean, gonna... I just wanted to say that oh. these classes, you're, these, these powerful classes are like God's seatbelts, you know, because throughout life, we get in these different cars, whether it's a wealth car, whether it's a coach car, whether it's a business car. And these classes allow us, it's like putting on our seatbelts when we get in these different cars. And so... It's a, it's a, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Joy, you and Stevie, y'all got some type of connection. You y'all got it going on today. Seat belts and fast cars and goodness, thank you so much for sharing that joy. You are really a joy. Thanks, Joy. So listen, let's go ahead and get you into the the breakout rooms. Um, you're gonna self select. If it is your first time, you just take your mouse. And you just bounce around and choose a room. If you have any issues getting into the room, it's no problem. Just either type the name of the room you want to go in in the chat space, and I'll put you in that room. Or you can unmute and say, Queen, put me in this room. Now, the rooms that you're going to choose from, um, you can go into one room that is called Faithfulness to Your Calling. And you could just, well, however it moves you, it is up to you. 
there are no specifics about how you should go about it. However you want to talk about the subject, do that. You may want to go in a room and talk about lessons from about from this, just download some lessons you got about Zacchaeus that we didn't talk about, or maybe you want to expand on something. Go in that room and talk about those insights. That way, when you are called to talk about a piece of this message in some form or another with your family or friends, you, you have already had practice articulating it. You may want to talk about marketing. Maybe you need some visibility on your business. Go in there and talk about some ways you can market with boldness. You may want to go in the networking room and just say, hey, this is what I do. What do you do? Maybe we can connect. Go into the networking room or go into the room and talk about niching. Maybe you understand that you are called to either be in the health, wealth, or relationship sector, but maybe you're not sure how to niche it down to the problem that you solve. You got to know the problem that you solve. Or maybe you already know how to niche and you can go and pour into somebody else. But go ahead, the rooms are open. Do you guys see the rooms? <clears throat> if you don't, you may have to press more and then go to join. Okay, Sandra is in the niche to my calling. If you're on a cell phone, you may have to go to more and then breakout rooms. But everybody else should be able to join. And if you can't join, then if you're having a hard time getting it, all you have to do is just say, hey, queen put me in the networking room or the niching room or the lessons room or faithfulness room but take your time no rush you just gotta keep your hands open you just gotta keep your heart open Teach me how to receive every blessing, every blessing. Okay, I got you, Tara Lynn. Teach me how to receive every blessing, every blessing. Give me you up now, Tara Lynn. To understand. How things work together. Anybody else need help? All you have to do is unmute and I got you. To believe that I will receive. Oh, yeah. He'll never fail. No, 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 no. Never seen the righteous forsaken. No. Okay, let's get you beautiful powerhouses out of here and onto your day. I hope that you enjoyed today's kingdom business. Hopefully you met another powerhouse in the breakthrough room that you can connect with at a higher level at another time. Let me just remind you that you don't have to re-register again. We're going to meet right back here on Tuesday at the same time, same Zoom link. Some of you uh, will want a little bit more time with me. It, if the, and if that is the case, feel free to join us on Saturday for the rehearsal stage. It is free yes. to register. Click the link and then register and you'll get email reminders. Then on Saturday, we're going to come together and we're going to talk about how to build your camera confidence with some easy steps. And we usually go for about 60 to 90 minutes. And so we're going to have um, a good time. Oh, let me save that. Yes, Rukama. Um, I was supposed to be in Atlanta next week, but I think I'm going to come like August. Um, I'll, I'll call you. I got your number. Thank you so much for putting your number in the chat for me. Um, so let's get you out of here. There's the link. Go ahead and click that link for the rehearsal stage, my loves. So that way, when we actually end this call, you will have that registration link. It's just a Zoom link and you can just be in the know for when we go to the rehearsal stage on Saturday. Everybody good? You guys are in a good place right now? All right, wonderful. Yes, please. And please go back and reread the story about Zacchaeus in Luke 19 and see if there's something else you can extract from it. A lot of folks will say to me, listen, how do you hear from God? I just don't hear his voice. He doesn't talk to me. I'm like, you got to you got a whole Bible right there. He's talking to you. It was relevant back then. And, and the beautiful thing about it is that it's still relevant today. There is nothing you're going through. There's not a problem that can't be solved without this. 
you can use this for every problem, everything that you're going through. I guarantee you is in here. All right. And the more you study his word, the more you'll be able to extract something that you can use for your business and your life strategies. So we are going to send you a new Bible case. <laughs> it's been with me for <laughs> years. You have been tried and proven. <laughs> it's been everywhere with me. Everywhere. You've been, you've been tried and proven, truly. As a, if, if it reflects that Bible case, you, I know. that's the seal of approval. I know, Joy. And look, I'm not going to even open it so you can see all my notes and stuff. You'd be like, yeah. That's, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, you guys get out of here and remember as you go about your day, loves, <laughs> never pass up the opportunity to take the mic. <laughs> bye, powerhouses. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Queen. Yes, love. I have a quick question. Um, okay. When I first signed.